Welcome back to So This Is Thailand, and today on Expert Advice, we have someone who may be able to, well, repair a, a damaged relationship or help you understand why all your past relationships ended so badly. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. Well, I'm sure we, we all have stories to tell, and I I'm sure. I wish you wouldn't look at me when you say that. Oh, I have to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll find out more about you after the after okay. the show. But I would like to introduce. Miss Ann White, who is a licensed professional counselor and an expert in marriage and family counseling. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Well, I know, you know, no matter where people are in the world, whether you're a foreigner, you're Thai, in between, we all have relationships. Ergo, we also have problems as well. True. Um, what's, what do you see as the, the most common problem, we might say, or condition in the relationship? Well. I think that there's so many different aspects to different stages in your life and different stages in a relationship because there's kind of a, a culture in our relationship that evolves over time. So a lot of times people um, go through different stages of, of being together and eventually sometimes if you've gotten married or you're in a committed relationship, after a while you become a little indifferent because it's kind of hard. You're not able to make the other person happy. So a lot of relationships we have, people get a little bored, they have an affair. Or they get bored in their relationship or they're, they become um, actually workaholics because they, they have an affair with their work instead mm -hmm. of their family, right? And so people are kind of dismissed in the family. And I think that with so many people, expats living here, that they have um, a lot of uh, expats that are traveling quite a bit, and so their families are separated during the week oftentimes. Sometimes they're traveling for weeks at a time, and the dad comes home and he's really tired, and he wants to watch TV, and he doesn't have any energy. Mm -hmm. And the mom is saying, I've been home for two weeks with the kids. Now you have to come <laughs> home and you have, to, you have to do stuff with this. You know, we have to go play baseball, and we have to go swimming, and we have to do all these things, and the dads are really tired. So there's different things that happen in, in relationships. The other thing is there's an imbalance in power because a lot of times the trailing spouse is disempowered because the partner that has the job has the bank account mm -hmm. and has the finances. And if you're the trailing spouse and you can't get a work permit and work here, there's frustration. There's also culture shock when you first arrive in the country that can last from six months to two years for some people. I've met one woman that had it for seven years and she was still <laughs> angry. It was like, I didn't want to come here and I'm still here. And it's like, well, it's a choice, you know, to, to embrace the country and the culture and what it has to offer, but culture shock has, you know, ups and downs. And you have moments where you think everything's great and you have the honeymoon period where it's wonderful and then you go through the cycle where things are very challenging and you have a really bad day and maybe it rains and thunderstorm and you have a flood on your soy and you can't get in and out. So many things happen. And so I think when people are dealing with all these stressors, sometimes there's a distance that grows between a couple. And when there's a distance, sometimes we build up resentment like bricks between a couple and then it creates a wall. So marriage counseling is about busting the wall, breaking it down in pieces and understanding it. And we do that several different ways. I like to prescribe books. I can't prescribe drugs, but I prescribe books. And I like that because I think the books can really help people. I don't want to keep people in therapy. I'd li rather they were out living their lives, right? So if they can read a book, the book that's my favorite so far is um, How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. It's written by a man and a woman. So both men and women can read it and say, yeah, this guy understands, and this woman understands. <laughs> and it's about women having fear and men having shame. If the men can't make their wives happy, they feel bad. Mm -hmm. If the women feel afraid, like they don't have financial security, they're not sure where they're going, they're not sure what kind of career opportunities they're going to have, they have fear. That triggers the man's shame and you have this downward spiral. So that can be very um, hard on a relationship. So anyway, I'm talking a lot. I don't want to... <laughs> well, actually, I, you, you had a lot of points that I, I got a lot of questions now about hearing all this. I'm like, oh wow, it's coming all clear in my mind. Why is it, you know, when you look at a relationship and, you know, especially in, in a married couple where you know, technically, you know, they've committed to each other for the rest of their lives, where there is such a difficulty in communication. You would think that it would be so easy to communicate with my spouse. Right. When you first get married, 
Uh, and I like to do premarital counseling, but the problem is people lie. <laughs> you know, when you're in love with somebody, you want to make them happy, right? And so you tell them everything you, they want to hear because you want to please the other person. Mm -hmm. And you don't intend to lie, but it's like, oh, kids, we don't need to worry about that now. Oh, yeah, I thought I said too. Yeah, okay, you know, mm -hmm. and they put it on hold, right? See? And so it's a commitment to how many children you're going to have, when you're going to have children. Are you going to stay in one place? Are you going to move around the world? Are you going to move every two years? Are you going to move once a year? You know, what, what are your, you know, options and so on? And so when people start feeling unheard, the other person starts shutting down, right? And so what women do is they tend to um, chase men and follow them but I'm not finished arguing I'm not you didn't hear what I was <laughs> saying you know come back I'm not done yet mm -hmm. and then men stonewall and they go into their cave you know and they don't want to talk anymore because they just they process in their head and women like to process out loud mm -hmm. so that's a physiological mm -hmm. difference right and we have physiological differences in sex too and so the issues that are really big between a lot of couples I think are um, you know, first of all, let's see, I've got this unbalanced power, affairs, falling out of love because you get bored, you think you've lost the love, and um, the buildup of resentment and lack of, of communication, and then sexual issues because people, if they don't feel connected, don't want to have sex, and so that kind of eliminates a part of, a big part of a marriage. And um, I think that people kind of drift apart sometimes, you know, and sometimes there's a difference in the shared dream for the future. And that creates some conflict and room for discussion. And I think sometimes people nowadays don't know how to compromise very well. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important when you're in a relationship to realize it's give and take, and you have to be able to be flexible. I think living internationally, we want our children to be brought up to be global citizens. And that means you're flexible. You can adapt. You can do things in, you, in your community that are, um, you know, you're not, you're not afraid to speak to a stranger. You're not afraid to talk to somebody from a different place. And you can communicate pretty well, even if you don't have the language sometimes. So I think that people that live this global life are really doing well and they and you want to encourage your children to be flexible and adaptable but it comes from the parents and if the parents don't have a good solid relationship the kids don't mm. they don't feel safe right so is it always possible to fix everything or no not always not mm. always I think the sad thing for me is that a lot of people come when they're ready to get divorced oh. instead of coming before sure. and I would rather see people when they're struggling at the very beginning and have some time to work with it before somebody's already out the door. Sometimes people already have an affair and it's called an exit affair because they think, I can't fix this relationship, I better find a new partner, mm -hmm. right? And in reality, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's important that people can really um, <clears throat> have, um, you know, fix themselves. This is about learning to know who you are, asking for what you need in your relationship, and getting it if you can. <coughs> Excuse well, me. Well, when you have, when you have a couple come in, mm -hmm. coming in to, to see you, if there was a communication problem between them, I know it might be a little, uh, from a guy's perspective, mm -hmm. you know, having a, a third person there, and then having to I guess publicize or, you know, my, Talk my about the, the differences. dirty laundry, right? The dirty laundry. <laughs> With someone else sitting there listening, it's I know from a guy's perspective, I, I would feel very threatened. I'd feel a very... Lot of men, a lot of men do. And the thing is, um, what I normally do is I like to do several sessions, and I'd start with seeing either each of them individually so that they have their own time to air their grievances, and uh, or I see them both together, and then I see them separately, and then we come back together, and we work on communication tools. We work on... Um, we work on uh, communication uh, dialogues and... and understanding problems, listing mm -hmm. the issues that are difficult to talk about, and then when we do the couples dialogue, we talk about the underlying issues, because usually there's a fire on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. But the real mm -hmm. argument is buried down here, and so we have to dig that out and figure out why that's such an issue. And I do that by using what I call a family genogram, and that's really fun because you can lay it out on the on a big piece of paper and you can put down as many generations as you have knowledge. Some people don't know their grandparents. They don't know what their names were. They don't know what they died from. Some people know five generations back. 
and they know their family history. They know if people have heart disease or diabetes or mm -hmm. cancer. And so you can track all these different things. And you look at traditions, you look at history, you look at migration, you look at all these different factors. Somebody died, somebody was murdered, somebody was in a car crash, you know? And you look at all these factors and it kind of creates a picture that's quite quite interesting. And even though you've been together maybe 20 years and you, you haven't quite connected all those dots mm -hmm. and understand understood each other's yeah. partners, families. Certainly a very um, interesting approach to uh, solving this kind of, uh, or getting a general look at it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was wondering, as just quickly before uh, we wrap up, uh, some of the books that you mentioned are really interesting. So until the next time we have you back, could you recommend some more? Well, as I said, my favorite book is How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. And I have a long list on my website. So if people are interested, they could go to the website right. and just download the book list. But um, could you look that up? Uh, my website mm -hmm. is anneowhite.com. Right. So um, if you go to the articles, under the articles, I have some um, articles that I've written for uh, a magazine that's no longer around <laughs> called Acclimate. And uh, then I have my book list on there. So it's, um, I have a lot of, I try and keep the book orders for how to improve your marriage without talking about it and after the affair in mm -hmm. stock at the Emporium at the Japanese bookstore because oh, I nice. help them sell a lot of those books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot more will be flying off the shelves. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank and you. Uh, we'd certainly hope to have you back. Thank you very much. Okay. Stay with us on So This Is Thailand. We'll be right back after the break. When people think of Yasotorn, we think of the spectacular rocket festival. But equally impressive are also the religious sites, which we are bringing you to see today. And one of those interesting religious sites is Prabhutabad, which means Buddha's footprint temple. The other is a newly constructed temple housing a magnificent white marble Buddha. But all of the origins come from the Buddha's footprint. Inside the stupa, you'll find examples of revered and respected forest monks who practice religion outside among nature and, almost importantly, a Buddha relic housed at the top. Yasotorn is the land of the faithful. There are many religious sites that most people have never seen, such as Praputabat in Yasotorn. The building we visited was constructed with funds that were 100% donated by the local community, the same as the next religious site. Just a short 30-minute drive from Yasotorn town and you arrive here, the location of Thailand and maybe even Asia's largest all-wooden Catholic church. You can see behind me, it's an impressive structure constructed entirely of wood found around locally and we'll find out about its humble beginnings and how it got to such an immense size and following as well. Let's go inside. St. Michael Church Songye is located in Kamtoi Taijerun district in Yasotorn province. What makes the church such an outstanding work of architecture is the local style combined with motifs of its Western religion. Final construction was completed 60 years ago, and the building has more than 300 solid wooden poles supporting the superstructure. Together, they make a unique place of worship that is unmistakably Thai and Catholic. Every day they have some activity, but sometimes they hold group marriages in this church. Four years ago, people in this area started restoring this church to become new, but still only used wood. As with most churches, right when you walk inside, you get an overall feeling of the grandeur and the auspiciousness of the occasion. The high ceilings, the vaulted, and of course ending in the beautiful asp at the end, it all is a part of the Catholic faith. And in here, as you can see behind me, there's enough in here for 1,000 people to attend. St. Michael Church Songye is an official unseen Thailand highlight, and one you won't want to miss while you're in the region. Starting from humble beginnings, this Catholic Church has grown into something which is really much larger than this structure is. It's come to encompass everyone in the community and has opened its doors to people of other faiths as well. So things like weddings, even if you're not Catholic, can be held here. Personally, when you walk in, you just get that sense of, well, spiritual calming. I guess that's the best. 
Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. I'll have to see you next time here in Yasotorn. Bye-bye.